down to Germany and when they bent them over the horse and the mule teams into the wilderness areas, when they got to the site, they stayed in this horseshoe shape. Oh. These saws here, you can bend them around a mule. The smoke jumpers jump with them. They'll bend them around packs and they'll, shoot, they'll throw them out of the planes uh, on parachutes. So the steel quality is unparalleled. If you ever try to drill through one of these, you'll, you'll get a lesson on that. But the most important thing with these saws, that the reason why they're so special is the way that they were ground. These saws are, are ground in a way they call a crescent ground. And how it was done back in the day was there was a massive grinding wheel that operated on a cam. It's actually swung like this. And so they would punch the steel out these teeth and they would slide it onto a table and an electromagnet would turn on and suck those things down so they wouldn't move at all. And this giant grinding wheel came and ground a crescent ground in them. What that means is that this here, this Atkins 53, is thickest in the middle, in the waist. And it will taper from this raker to the back five gauges. That's five thicknesses of sheet metal. And not, not only that, but it also tapers back to the points three gauges. So it is ground like a big circle. What's the advantage of that? Why is that important? It's important because when the saw is working and it's in the kerf, because it's so much skinnier in the back and because it's so much skinnier to where the handles connect on the ends, the teeth don't have to have a lot of set in them. And what that means is, is any saw that cuts, the teeth have to be sticking out wider than the body of the saw. If they're not, if they're the same thickness, you get in about an inch or two and the saw will bind, it won't cut at all. So a saw like this, this Atkins 53, with such a fantastic grind on it, means you, can, you only have to have a tiny bit of set, two to three thousandths of a set. So what that means is, is you are cutting a very tiny bit of wood. It's, just a, it's like a laser beam going through it. A saw that is not tapered ground will have to have 13, even 15 thousandths of set in the teeth. And what that does is that makes for more work. And it meant a lot back in the day because the loggers uh, did not own the saws. The saws were owned by the logging companies. They were very expensive. And the, and the fellers got paid by the tree. So if you had a saw that was really efficient and cut well, you could make twice as much money. So it meant everything to have it. The reason why it's curved like this and everything about that saw is designed to work with the human body the way it saw, the way it moves. It's ergonomically, it's the, it's the ergonomic perfection when it comes to saw, that, that shape and that design. So these saws uh, weren't produced after, let's say 1955, 19, yeah, probably about the mid 50s or so, and they're just irreplaceable. So there's a lot of people that are finally understanding that and buying these things and cleaning off all of the paint and the deer and all that stuff and putting <laughs> these spe things back into service. And this, I, I went to the school, I guess it was this year, the Forest Service runs a school at the Nine Mile Ranger Strait Station in Montana where they run three classes a day with six people per class and they keep these traditions alive. And the reason is, is that these saws are still used in wildernesses. Because wil in wilderness areas, we can't use any power tools. No chainsaws, no equipment. And so anyone who goes in there to fight forest fires, anyone who goes in there to do trail maintenance, they use these saws. So I was lucky to get into the class and, and a lot of people that were in there were Forest Service people and, and I talked to them and they said, you know, really, we pack in for two weeks or three weeks into these trails and the crosscut saws are more efficient than chainsaws. One, we don't have the noise and the weight. We don't have to pack fuel and oil. And if the saw is taken care of and if it's sharpened properly, uh, it, it is amazingly efficient. This particular saw uh, I sharpened at the class and we had a 32 inch piece of pine and when it was fresh off the bench each pole would cut an inch and that was with no weight just the weight of the saw mm -hmm. so it's it's very interesting and the more i learn about these old tools and the more i use them whether it be timber framing chisels or these old saws uh, it's amazing how efficient they are once once you learn how to use them and once you learn how to sharpen them and become proficient with them really sometimes by the time you pull out the, the extension cords and, and get the skill saw, get the earmuffs and all those things. You could do the job in half the time with a saw or with a hand tool that, that you know how to use. It's properly sharpened. So that's basically the reason why these saws are so special.
every saw back in the day was named, it was given a name, they were always given females names. And the saw filers had uh, worked in the logging camps, were very well taken care of by the guys. Because if you ever got on the wrong side of the saw filer, he might give you a saw that just didn't quite cut right. Mm. <laughs> and when you got paid by the log, paid by the tree, uh, you wanted to be in with him. And all the old guys will say that every once in a while, I don't, we don't know why, but there just was a special saw. We would just get one that was just, just head and shoulders above the other. We filed them the same, they looked the same, but something about them just made them cut better. So it's, it's a, there's a lot of history in that and it's really interesting. Two types of saws, basically. There are felling saws and bucking saws. This here is a light bucking saw. It's got two holes for handles, you can see, and it's flat across the back. This would be a saw that you would use for cutting bucking, cutting logs in half. It's usually going to be a little bit thicker and a little bit stiffer. A bucking saw, when you have two sawyers on it, can actually, you can help your buddy and push a little bit. It won't bind up. This saw here is a felling saw. You can tell that because it'll have one hole for a handle and it's got a curve in the spine. And it's much thinner and much lighter. And the reason for the curve it's because a felling saw cuts this way. When you're cutting down trees, the curve allows you to get a wedge started quicker without going in and hitting the back of the saw. And you don't need that extra hole. The reason for the hole, the second hole, is depending on the wood, depending on the team, you can raise that handle up and get a little bit more leverage. It's just like the principle of having a pry bar. The longer the pry bar, the more weight you can push. The higher the handle is mounted on the crosscut saw, the more it pushes the teeth down, the more you can cut. There are exceptions to that, but for the most part, that is basically what you have. If you're looking for used crosscut saws, you're gonna want one of these. It's a, it's a sheet metal gauge. I keep this in my pocket, because I'm always stopping at garage sales, and I want to know, this will tell me what, if I can find a saw that's crescent ground. So if I check my sheet metal thickness here and here, and I've, get, I've got four or five, uh, degrees of taper or thicknesses of metal and from the spine to here I've got two or three that means I've got a really special saw there and if it's not pitted and the rakers aren't all broken then that's when you're gonna want to buy because a saw like this just in this condition this was my grandfather's saw uh, he bought in the 30s when they moved uh, to Idaho from from the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma uh, is worth if you could find one five to six hundred dollars just for the blade and only going up so if you can find one of these at a garage sale, even if you don't restore it, even if you don't know how to sharpen it yet, just get them. Just get a couple of them, hang them up on the hook, um, and they'll be there when you need them. Handles. Lots of different styles of handles. The best handles are the Western style handle, and these are Atkins number 24s. And this is a classic handle for a crosscut saw. This is a hand guard. It's got a retained pin on here, and how it works, and what makes these unique is they can be uh, run two ways. So the pin goes in. And you can see you can run the handle this way. Or you can even run it sideways. So if you are bucking or a part you are felling with it and you prefer to run it this way, some people do, you can. It just gives you some options. And this is simply nothing more than a hand guard. The hand guards on the vintage handles are pretty hard to find. Usually they're gone or broken. Oftentimes the saw crews, they didn't take them with them because they had to carry all this stuff and they didn't want the extra weight. What they did do instead was break off the teeth on the edges right where their hands were because they didn't want to get their hands in those teeth. So don't worry if you find a saw that's got a couple teeth broken off on the edges. Uh, that was usually done on purpose and it doesn't affect the saw because you, most of your cutting is done at the waist anyway. You're not going to be cutting over here too much. So, so that is that. So I'll put this handle on and then we can play with this a little bit and I'll show you what it's like. And you can break a hand. Right. <laughs> Jessica and I cut down a tree, a dug fir tree two months ago in our yard that was a little over four foot across at the base. It was a big tree. And we fell it with a cross cut saw and the face cut I knocked out with the axe and it took 
four hours. And the majority of that was the axe work mm -hmm. and not the, not the saw work. It, it, it's fun and it's interesting to me, but I, I think that it, for God's people, um, these could have um, become something that are very important mm -hmm. when you no longer have the ability use the uh, to, to use a chainsaw to buy and to sell. Because that chainsaw right there, without fuel and without very specialized mixed oil and chains and, and, and replacement parts, is essentially useless. It is useless. It's not worth anything. This, on the other hand, uh, is from um, probably built 1920, and here we are still using it. And we can go down, and just like my wife and I demonstrated last month, you could take down a tree and buck it into pieces and actually use it and survive and, and build. So I think they have a place, and it's important for us to acquire these things now and understand how to use them and become proficient with them. Uh, for when we really need to, we're not going to be in a pickle because we'll have enough to, enough to worry about without trying to figure out how to sharpen one of these then. So this is a felling saw. Uh, this is not a bucking saw, but it doesn't mean it can't work for both rolls. The only difference is is you, you can't push it at all. So can you hold this, Brandon? Sure. So the proper technique, what a lot of people tend to do is is to pull it to themselves back and forth. But the correct way to do it is to is to stand and to and to move beyond like this, back and forth. That curvature allows the saw to be used most efficiently. Back and forth like this. And it's best when you're first starting as a saw team, there's a lot of coordination that needs to take place with each other. And it's best not to put any weight on it at all, just the weight of the saw until we get the rhythm. So we'll just we usually you'll start start moving it, pick up the teeth, you start move pick it up off the wood. You start moving it and then we'll lower it down and we'll drop it into place. And we'll just let the weight of the saw, just let the weight of the saw cut. And as we get better, we're, cut, we're, we're cutting on the pole, give a little bit of downward pressure. And the higher you raise your hand, the harder it will cut. How much effort are you putting into this, Brandon? Not too much. Just basically a little bit of a little bit of push. Am I pushing or pulling? You're pulling. <laughs> I told you about one of the those special saws that come out every once in a while. This is one of them. And I took this saw to the class. We'd realized it had never been sharpened. It was a brand new saw. With a, a proper saw, a bucking saw, yeah. and two guys who have worked together for a day, you could do that in a fourth of time. So these strips you see here are called uh, noodles. And this tells you everything you need to know about how a saw saw is sharpened. And the, this is a, a really a, a really a sharp saw and it cuts well. If a noodle has a lot of whiskers on it, what that tells you is that your rakers are too deep. As the blades come through and cut, they cut two strips on both sides of the kerf. The raker scoops those up, stores it in the gullet here, and then as the saw exits the, exits the kerf, it dumps all that stuff out. 
So you can look at these and you can see that they don't have excessive whiskers on them and they're nice and long 